James actually mentioned the fact that principals have said to him that they sometimes feel isolated, and you know very well that sometimes the role of the principal can be you know, somewhat lonely. So what you need, of course, is the buffer zone of the fabulous leadership team, and we've got some of our own colleagues to talk to you today about what, how they've been able to optimise their the capacity of their leadership team in order to support them in their endeavours. So Judy Crow, the resident elect of that, currently the principal of Melbourne Girls, is going to run a panel with two principals and they're going to introduce themselves. So I'll leave them to come up here, invite them to come to the stage and Judy will take over from there. Yes, I'm Scott Diamond. Uh, I'm the principal of Surf Coast Secondary College and have been a the principal there for three years. Um, we're a new school. We were born of a demerger at Torquay uh, P9 College. Um, we began the, at the beginning of 2012 um, with year 7 to 10 enrolment and this year moved to a, to a new site in, uh, in North Torquay with year 7 to 12 enrolment. Um, and we've enjoyed some, some good enrolment growth over the last a uh, couple, uh, couple of years. Um, we've built, we're a school that's built for around 920 students um, and we'll be welcoming in 140 year sevens uh, next year, uh, which is um, which is sort of considerable growth for, for us over the past couple of years. And um, yeah, looking forward to hopefully continuing the growth over the next, uh, over the next year as well. Yeah, my name is Rob Dramovich, I'm a principal of Warrigal Regional College. Uh, we're a school of uh, 750 students um, in a, a growth area. Our enrolments are kind of gradually going up. We're in a, a very competitive environment. Now we have a uh, Catholic um, private school, a high fee independent school, a low fee independent school, and also another uh, three other secondary schools within 10 minutes of our school. So quite a competitive uh, environment that we're in, we're holding our ground. Well, the school is a, um, is a merger of uh, an old tech school and high school we're on the same site. Um, and we've still got, uh, I guess, quite a, a stable staff, uh, an older staff, um, and managing, I guess, um, that transition of that older staff as, uh, as they go into retirement and new staff coming and trying to maintain all the good things about the school, but also um, the energy of the, of the new grades coming in. So, Rob, in your context, um, the terms leadership and team, what do they mean to you? I think they're probably two of the most overused terms in education. I think that we describe things as leadership and we talk about people being in teams when neither is actually true. Um, I'm not going to be too semantic about it, but uh, you know, what leadership means to me, I guess the things that we describe leadership as, is perhaps defining it um, 
as opposed to management. Uh, I think that leaders do manage, it's a very important component of your work, but um, if they're only managing and they're not really leading, so what happens um, if someone's leading is really, for me, they're leading change. That's really the purpose of, of leadership is to, is to lead change. And so thinking about leadership in those terms, how they um, lead the school forward. I think the other, the other part of leadership where I see um, people make mistakes when I'm coaching them around leadership is thinking that leadership is about them doing everything. I think that if you're doing everything, you're just working really hard. That's actually not leadership. And perhaps really what we're wanting to see is being able to work through others and influence others. And that's, that's kind of where I think it's a much harder thing to do working directly and work through others, but ultimately that's what leaders do. Context, what you're really talking about is um, how you take control of the agenda um, and not have your role defined by others. So what do you do strategically to make sure that that happens? Well, I think it's a, it's a really hard one. I'm you know, talking to um, lots of colleagues uh, over the course of the conference and just talking about how busy everyone is. And I think that you know, it is probably our busiest term of term three for principles. Um, and with the reviews and everything else that's going on, there are a whole lot of, um, I guess, external influences um, that are driving your agenda, and that feels a bit stressful and uncomfortable at times, I think. So how do you pull back that agenda? And there are certain things that I think that you can't um, push back on, but really trying to find those things that you can push back on. For me, it's very much about maintaining a strategic focus and being disciplined about that strategic focus. You know, my school, We've used the same set of slides for the past six years. I've been there for six years, and, and the agenda hasn't really changed for six years. It's about really the same journey and, and, and maintaining that discipline and trying to, I guess, the key role of the leader is protecting the organisation from the things that are um, likely to disrupt it. Um, so for us, being open, I guess, to our opportunities, but also um, being disciplined enough to not grab every shiny new thing that comes your way, because uh, that really pisses staff off, I think, when they, they see that kind of thing get up for the team when that, that happens. Yesterday, I was conscious, um, as we heard from Paul the when he was talking about us as leaders having to be present for everyone and being authentic in our relationships. Um, and that's quite a challenge um, when you have a large group of staff for whom we are responsible. So how, how do you manage that? How do you have those direct relationships with staff? If you have to do. Well, I think that's, I mean, it depends what you're talking about relationship. I mean, for me, it's about having a personal relationship with staff. And we've talked to, um, to a couple of colleagues, uh, you know, about how close should you be with your staff. You know, if you're going to have to have difficult um, conversations with them, should you be close with them? And I think you know, I've had this conversation before. I, I, I kind of disagree with that distance that you need to have. People talk about principles have distance from their staff. I actually don't see that. I, I think that. If you think about the most, uh, the relationship you have that are most successful probably with your family, you have an extremely close relationship and you can both, with your children, be a disciplinary if you have to be, but really also show them love. And I think that, you know, if you think about that emotional bank account that you need to build up with your staff in order to have a difficult conversation, I think that becomes very important. But, you know, my school, and these guys' schools, you know, and all of you guys are probably pretty much the same, you know, we've got 90 staff, I can't have a, a, a close working relationship with everyone on my staff. So that's really around having a, a strong distributed, distributed leadership model where not every staff member is directly answerable to me. I really want my staff to be answerable to the leadership team and the appropriate member in the leadership team and not kind of just come straight to the principal all the time. And so being you know, disciplined enough to be able to say, well, look, you know, I hear what you're saying, go back and talk to the most appropriate person. In this same um, space, because you, with the growing school and where you are located, I imagine you have a lot of young staff, maybe even a Gen Y people we were talking about yesterday. Um, so, how do you identify and foster leadership in those young teachers? Yeah, I think it. I think it comes to um, a couple of things that we're, we're spoken about yesterday, and uh, it's really, it's really looking for people who are, who are committed, committed to the work and. And something that I found, um, and my colleague touched on it um, yesterday, was that regardless of which generation are coming into to, to your school, I think that generally we get teachers into the into the into the, into the 
schools um, who are committed to working with uh, with young people and committed to developing their own practice and the things that they can uh, contribute around the school. So I think regardless of, um, of which generation it's around, um, I guess, you know, supporting and identifying, you know, people and your staff who want to develop um, their skills in certain areas throughout the school. And I think one of the things that I've learned, um, you know, sort of being, being involved, um, you know, in, in education and working in schools is, is that there's um, so many opportunities for, for so many different people with different uh, skills and, and interests to be able to, um, to provide positive input with, uh, within the school. And I think at times it's, 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 it's our job as a leadership team within the school to be able to, to sort of best uh, support teachers to develop those skills and interests in, in ways that we're going to support the, the bigger picture um, of, the, of the school. And, and you know, I think that that's something that we've definitely attempted to do um, um, at, at Surf Coast, and you know that probably began with, um, with the building program that we had, where the teachers were involved in, uh, in, in the initial sort of design and development phase um, of the school, and, and now the, the school is reflective of a lot of, a lot of things that um, that those original sort of foundation staff members um, uh, you know wanted to have in, included in the school. And, you know, so, you know, I think there's uh, some examples of that at our school um, around uh, the, the hospitality. Areas within our school which is directly related to the um, to the, to the environment that, that we're in, surf coast, where um, you know hospitality, and tourism, those sorts of things are, are really the places where you know a lot of our students are able to get their part-time work and contribute to the to the community. So I think being able to um, uh, to sort of identify the you know the, the interests and the, and the areas that, um, that the staff in the school want to develop is um, is a really good starting point for, for being able to foster, foster that leadership. Um, do you think that being a good teacher necessarily means that someone's going to be a good leader in terms of the school context? Do the two have to go hand in hand, or can you have people who are perhaps not so good in the classroom but will eventually be good leaders? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I think that's something that's, um, that's been debated around schools for a long time. But, um, I mean, particularly in our, in our city, um, I think it's really important to have a, a strong knowledge of, uh, of learning and teaching practice, um, definitely to, to be able to, um, to support the teachers that are in the school. And um, that's something that we've, um, we do have um, a lot of teachers, a lot of new teachers who are coming to our school every single year and will again next year and, and the year after. And one of the really important things that our leadership team needs to do is to be able to, to support those teachers to work within, I guess, the learning and teaching culture that we've developed. Um, within our school, so I think probably to answer that question, that if they if they haven't been fantastic classroom teachers, then I think they really need to to know what fa fantastic um, learning teaching looks like and how to support um, people within um, within the school to, to be able to develop those um, to develop those skills. Well, I imagine down on the sort of coast, um, a lot of the reasons that people are attracted to that area are because of their interests in the um, natural environment, perhaps. So, and that's the thing. so I'm interested from your point of view about how you model in that small community appropriate leadership qualities um, to the broad range of staff you would have down there. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the reasons, but I think one of the other reasons that um, people are attracted to, um, to, to that area of the world is um, is, 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 a, is, a, is a great area. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, lot of our teachers on staff with um, with young families who have moved into the area or have been, uh, been long-time residents of, of the area down there at, um, at Surf Coast. So I guess one of the, one of the first things that I did in, in sort of moving down um, to, you know, back then to Torquay was, was being, um, being present within the community, whether that be um, involved in sporting clubs or um, whether it be involved in other community organisations. Uh, we've got a really supportive um, uh, local Local, 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 local shy down at uh, the surf coast, so it's been important to be uh, present with, um, with them. And I think you know, that sort of modelling that it's hard to work with people to do um, as, as leaders within a school can have an effect um, you know, sort of more broadly within the community. One of the things that, um, that we attempted to do at, uh, at the very start was to, um, to sort of shape up the way that we did our way that we sort of did our, our meeting times and the sorts of things that we do um, out of school hours and um, for the for the first in the first year we, we implemented a process where um, teachers um, had 
had an hour of that meeting time um, that they could uh, they could commit at um, at any time that, that, that they could uh, that they could do it. And every second week they needed to commit to um, to engaging in a um, just in time learning activity around digital learning, and then the other the other week, the ultimate week, was around a contribution to the to the community. And it was really about we were the first, um, we were the only secondary school um, in the Torquay in the Torquay um, area, the, the, the immediate area of Torquay. It was around it was really around that idea that um, a little bit like the old uh, the old schoolhouse moving into you know, a, a, a local community gets to schoolhouse, you know, back in the I don't know what the night is, but it was, and the fact that that community then felt this um, this amazing sort of um, uh, investment within within their community, and, and, and sort of has this uh, this additional resource within the community around around learning and around this uh, this person who was one teacher school um, who contributed to the community. We were trying to sort of um, to sort of develop that that same idea within uh, at Surf Coast Secondary College to sort of say. Okay, we've got this uh, this group of people within our community now who can contribute a little bit more widely than just uh, just during school hours. Um, whether that be at the local sporting club, or whether it be at the community centre around, around sort of doing homework programs, whether it be sort of you know, helping out at the primary school with their after school hours care yeah, and those sorts of things. Didn't go as well as what uh, we would have thought. Uh, just around those um, those ideas of, uh, of, of, of teachers committing to that and doing that. Um, Every single week, but it's definitely something that we probably have to look back at. Yeah. So, do you think there are aspects that being in a rural community make, make it different in terms of the way we relate to the whole staff, but to your leadership team in particular? And Robert, you might have a perspective on this because you've been in a city school and then moved to a rural context. But so, you might respond to the show. Yeah, I think, um, I just think the proximity of the community, I think everything that you do. Um, and and having worked in, in other schools in, uh, in suburban in suburban Melbourne, and then moving to a to a place where we're, we're the only school in that community, you, you definitely you definitely not show up. You have really important thing to uh, to share with uh, with your leadership team and the things that, that are happening within the school um, have really the impact um, on the community. And, you know, just um, uh, just the, just the, just the other day, just getting phone calls from from parents about certain things that are. Happen at and around the school, and being uh, being able to, to sort of respond to those um, as quickly as possible. And we, you know, we've got there the same track as a lot of schools. Um, you know, using social media to be able to communicate um, to our parents. Um, it's a really um, active uh, parent body um, in, the, in the Surf Coast area, and as um, James Galeno was saying, they have very high expectations of their of their local government school definitely. Um, in, uh, in that area, and that's something that um, we've got to be really aware of every single day, but I don't think that's any different um, uh, to any other school. What do you think of that? I think it's, um, I did a talk about this um, last night with uh, the fund manager just talking about and telling you about how um, it is one of those things you need to perhaps be a little bit more uh, careful about um, how you operate in the community. I've only so the last five years I've been back in Warrigal prior to that, I haven't worked in the town even though I grew up there. So I know, um, you know, more than half the parents, uh, or know their, grand their grandparents, and, and that really helps, I think, uh, a lot. Um, a lot of the, the teachers that are still at school taught my brother, I didn't go to school either, but my brother did. So there's kind of a different relationship, I think, that you have with people, and that, that relationship obviously changes when you come back as a principal. But, you know, when I, I used to be able to go to the pub and walk around with moccasins on and those sort of things, I think you're a little bit more visible. Um, so you need to be a little bit more careful, I guess, about other things. But, uh, but I think that there's, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to have the sacrifices around that um, because for me it's about the, those relationships and there's a, there's a level of trust whenever I have a, a difficult uh, conversation. If I know the family, then there is already trust and respect there and you know, halfway towards solving the problem and you know, certainly working with kids being able to say, look, I know your dad would not find that acceptable, I know your, your grandmother would be really unhappy with your behaviour at the moment. It gives a, you know, a, a, a lot of, I guess, social pressure for students to, to um, behave in the way they have to expect them to. Claire, um, I know you don't wear your moccasins around too very often. <laughs> 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 
fairly recently, you had a very experienced principal team at Q, and I understand there have been some changes in that. And uh, what I'm interested to know is whether your approach as principal within the leadership team has had to change as your team has changed. It definitely has. Um, I began, when I began, I had um, one AP that came on board with me, and then the next year we had another person that came on board, and the three of us gelled, and we had probably um, connecting capabilities, uh, each of us had different ones, so as a team we worked really well. And we found that we were the ones that developed the vision of the school, we were able to think forward and say, okay, this is where we want the school to go, and we developed all the strategies, and I suppose in doing that, um, to a certain extent, we disempowered the leadership team. But we had a leadership team that was fairly fractured. Um, our approach to begin with was we had short leading teacher meetings, and each of the leading teachers really reported on their area of responsibility. Um, as time went on, we did align all our meetings, uh, and we started to change our thinking that this leadership team now needed to be more concerned with leadership across the whole school. So we started to talk about search environment, we started to talk about leadership rather than management, we started to talk, to talk about symbolic leadership and cultural leadership. We brought in a process of training the trainer, so we decided we would work um, on positive psychology, positive thinking, we had someone in to do some PD with the leadership team, and then the idea was that they would then take it to their teams and filter it down, which was a very effective model. We put in our performance and development um, system and we put each of those leading teachers in charge of the team. That gave them uh, the role, a significant role, that was outside their own area. Um, then last year when Bernie left, um, we realised we needed to again rethink our leadership team. We talked a lot about what made an effective team, um, our focus on teaching and learning, what we needed to do with teaching and learning, and we unpack that to say, all right, there are some aspects of it that we don't do very well in the school. We want the leadership team to be the drivers of that change. So now we extend our leadership meetings. Um, we talk about all our leaders as being leaders of learning. We don't necessarily focus on their own area of responsibility, but rather about performance and development, about accountability across the school, about looking at the data across the school, about developing documents, for example, on feedback, um, that they can agree on and then they'll take them through to their leadership team. So I guess we've um, begun to give them more power, um, begun to give them more ownership and begun to talk the conversation of, you know what, you're the drivers of change at Kew High. It's not just about the principal, principal class team, it's about the whole team. So without um, wanting to be presumptuous, um, you've been at the game quite a long time and you know, I'm interested when you, and I'm, I guess I ask this question because I'm in a similar situation, when you project and you think of the school without you um, in some years to come, does that, having that sense in your head, does that make you operate in a different way with your leadership team? Do you do things, do you stand back or, how does that change you personally in terms of your relationships? Uh, it's a continuation pretty much of what I've been talking about in that um, the push has been to make sure that the leadership team had the same passion I did, uh, had the same belief in the values of the school, had the same belief in the, the vision, that we was a shared vision. And now there's been very much a move on my part to ensure that um, they're able to step forward, that instead of me posing, <coughs> excuse me, Um, instead of me getting up there with the framework and saying, oh, this is the way we need to go, it's sitting down with each of those people now and saying, for example, if you're in charge of e-learning, what is your vision for the next three years and how does that fit in? So it's putting the onus back on them to come up with the vision themselves. It's getting to ask the questions. So when we talk about the way forward now, I'm not putting the questions up there. I'm saying, what do you think is the way forward? Um, so that when I vacate the chair, there's not going to be this big gap there, that, that they are all there, they understand. <coughs> Excuse me, I feel like I'm on an interview here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the case you are. <laughs> um, that, um, that the 
corporate memories there and regardless of whether I'm there or not, they feel empowered, they feel it's their school. I'm asking them to step forward, to do the presentations in the staff meetings, uh, to go and find the, the resource material, to do the research. Um, I guess I'm doing a bit more of the flipping the classroom myself. I, I prepare a one note for the leadership meeting. Uh, I don't send out the agenda. They need to, they understand, they need to go that one note. They need to see what the agenda is. Um, if we've decided on a topic, they need to have done a bit of reading and come prepared for it. Uh, I guess I want them to um, develop some consistency. I want them to be more accountable. I've raised the bar in my expectation and that is also that when I do go, uh, and it's not tomorrow, um, that the school functions without me, that there's a distributed leadership um, and they're all equally aware that they have a role to play and a significant role to play if the school's going to move forward. Um, we have had the staff survey, which has been a pretty blunt instrument, and within it there has been a capacity for us to get some data about the performance of the leadership team. But beyond that, I'm interested in um, how you know you're being successful, how do you know you are being successful as a principal in your operation as a leader within that leadership team, and, and how do you know the team itself is successful? Because all that you've described sounds good, but at the end of the day, you know, how, how do you know, you know, how, how do you convince yourself that you've got the right strategies in place? I suppose you have to have a bit of faith. Um, you have to believe that the school will be successful without you. And for me, uh, I need to believe that the programs and the policies and um, those things that I've set up and I believe are, are core to you, um, the story practices, the role of relationships, um, the overseas program, the sister school relationships, um, the drama, the volleyball, the production that happens every couple of years, uh, the focus on teaching and learning, the strong performance and development culture, that all of that will continue, and I believe it will. Um, I believe there's enough, uh, enough people in the school um, that are part of it, uh, and I guess you get a sense of the culture of the place. Um, there's not a lot of um, people that are disheartened in the school. There is a lot of collegiality, there is a lot of sharing, there is a... Uh, Everybody is on board with the, the performance and development. They're all going into each other's classrooms. They're all developing their curriculum together. And I think if you have that and you don't have um, a fractured community, then I think that that's a way of judging that there is success. And for me, um, the final success will be if the school is able to function without me, and I suppose it's a seamless um, move on without me, and that doesn't mean that the person that comes in has to continue everything that I've done, but they are able to come into a school that has a strong leadership, a strong belief in itself, a strong reputation in the community, and that that will continue without me. Yes, the new leader might take it in a different way, um, might uh, believe different things from me, but the school's not going to fall in a heap when I go, and I think that I'm, I'm trying desperately to set up that process and that foundation in the school that will when the school is strong, regardless of whether I'm there or not. And I think that's the measure of success. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Scott, in a different school, a um, different state of career perhaps? Um, how do you evaluate your own success and that of your leadership team? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, that we've spoken about in our leadership team over the past couple of years, I mean, we've at the majority of our leadership teams, you know, these teachers that are new to the role. Um, but one of the things that we've spoken about as a leadership team is that idea of um, you know, the, the, the finding the work, that idea of this circle of influence that you have um, as a leader. I think one of the hardest things um, about being a leader within a school is that idea of, of whereabouts is the work. You can't, as a leader, you can't wait for your particular portfolio area to come up in a, in a, staff, in a staff meeting agenda. And it's that idea of you know, where, where's the work that happens you know, from Monday to Friday, um, in, in the time that, uh, that you have in, in working within the portfolio that you might have within the school. Um, we've got um, the way that our leadership team is structured is that we have two sub school leaders and then um, two other leading teachers who have sort of whole school responsibilities. But, um, but I think as, as Claire was saying, it's that idea of that it's not um, just particularly a portfolio, it's that, it's that idea of being able to lead um, a whole team in, in the work that, um, that you're doing. So, 
looking for success um, is around the idea of, of what that particular initiative that we're working on, or that, um, that idea that we're working on, what it looks like. Being able to set up those operational definitions at the beginning of the, of the work that we do uh, within those areas, and that's something that we spend a lot of time on uh, within our leadership meetings or um, individually when our um, catching up with the, with the leading teachers um, is around what, what, what's it going to look like if this is successful. Um, we, do, we do talk uh, more widely as a, as a print class group about the idea of, of collegiality. What does collegiality actually look like? Is it bringing a birthday cake on someone's birthday or is it actually sort of following the process and um, ensuring that the systems within our school are working consistently? And, and that's something that we've talked about with our staff um, you know, quite, quite a fair bit. I think it relates a bit back to the stuff that Mike McQueen was talking about yesterday, that it's not about uh, getting a pat on the back every single day for turning up to, to work, it's about making sure that you've uh, done the things that you need to do to ensure that the systems within the school are, are operating successfully. And uh, that, That's some of the work that we've done, but to be able to identify what's successful, uh, we needed to do the first thing first, which was working out what, um, what, we, want to, what we want to be achieved and what that actually looks like. Oh, uh, probably um, for me, um, really the RP is really important document for our school and made it work for us. Uh, I think when we um, initially when we started to write these documents, you'd have your shopping list of strategies. You think the more strategies you had, the better the plan was, you know, one of them was going to work, but becoming much more uh, focused about the, the RP and, and we, we have, have it listed in a couple of short sentences about what it is that we're trying to achieve in our school, you know, so and there are posters in every office, in every, uh, every one of our um, team offices that that's up and we refer to it regularly in our, in our staff meetings and so the RP is, I guess, linked to um, obviously a strategic plan and so really that's the, the job of the leadership team. Clearly, you know, we want to manage well and, um, you know, we've talked about you know, just getting trains to run on time. You know, we want we want an, an, an effective organisation. That's the, the basis. But really, that's that's meat and potatoes. If you're going to have a really good school, then you really need to be achieving your strategic vision, and that is set out in the RIP. And if you're not, you know, it's not regularly in people's faces, then what's the point of the document in the first place? You know, for me, you know, keeping the strategy up front, keeping the score, and making sure that you're not, you know, you're feeding back to people regularly about how we are. Um, against the things that we set out, having a really limited number of things that you're going to be working on keeps the whole staff focused on the things that you want to be able to achieve. And when you can push back, I guess, data around, you know, that we're achieving success in attendance, these are our attendance rates, you know, what's happening in year eight, you guys are doing a great job. What's happening in year 10, we're falling behind a little bit. Go back to the year 10 team, talk about what you guys need to do differently. But, you know, feeding back data regularly enables, I guess, the whole school to see that we actually um, can achieve together and, and it is, it's linked and focused to uh, a bigger picture and, and sometimes in the hurly burly and day to day uh, of school you can sometimes lose um, the, the line of sight to that strategic vision so keeping it up front of people's heads is really important in my view. You've been uh, talking about staff and it just struck me, the role of the school council, we're talking about leadership teams, I think we've got any sense of um, the role of the council um, in terms of the data, the AIP, do you pull that into that or do you see it more as a staff thing or just report to council? Well, the council, I think it's really important for council to um, have that data we share data at every council meeting. I think they're sick of it, to be honest. But uh, I think it's really, you know, if one of council's roles is oversight, then you need to be feeding back the data about the schools performing, you don't want any surprises there, but you know, certainly they have less ownership around that because they don't, they can't influence it really where I think for leadership teams and for staff they actually can influence it and it's critical to their day-to-day -day work. Uh, I'd like to get some questions from the audience at this point. We've got three very experienced and competent principals up here. So are there any questions from the floor about this topic of optimising talent for a successful leadership team. Mm -hmm. One, no, I'm um, disputing whether we're experienced. <laughs> I'm in charge. <laughs>
that was it. The panel members received feedback. We have that seat. So you might post that again. <laughs> um, I was just asking uh, how each panel member um, seeks feedback um, from the whole school community. I think uh, I'm going to start here. Like one of the um, things I've done recently in the absence of the staff being surveyed was uh, a BS staff meeting and also a teaching staff meeting um, requested uh, feedback over a two week period to a nominated um, staff member that was to be anonymous and then after two weeks that staff member came and shared that feedback with me, um, which was interesting and a little bit um, painful at the end of term two when reports and all those sort of things have been written in PDP and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but that was, that was really useful, there were some things that I thought were fair and there were things that I thought were, were unfair which I, you know, I'm happy to, to leave to one side. But I, I think it is critical to be getting feedback um, from your stakeholders. We get feedback from students a lot. Um, we regularly are surveying our students about performance but really as a leadership team we really should be getting more feedback I, I think from um, from the people who are leading in order to improve it. That's, how, that's the purpose of feedback is to improve it. You know? and so if that's the focus, you know, what can I take out of that? What are one or two things that I might be able to take out of, out of that and do differently? And so I've gone back to staff and said, well, here's, here's one of the things that you can go and feedback about that I actually um, resonate with me and this is what I'm going to try and do about it. So if you notice me doing more of it, then please give me some positive feedback. If you notice I'm not doing it, then you let me know as well. Yeah, one of the things uh, that, that we've done, we've, we've, I guess, I guess with, the, with the feedback that we've tried to received from the, from the staff at our school was it's been, um, it's been more qualitative. Um, one of the protocols we've used is, um, is, a, is a clearinghouse protocol um, where the ideas or the, the things that are on the minds of the staff, we've been able to share those. Um, we, we, did, we did that at the beginning of this term, actually one of the staff meetings that we did, we had this uh, meeting where we wanted to identify what are the, what are the stresses that, um, or what are the things that people think are going to be sort of stressful over the, over the next period of time. Um, and then we were able to sort of share those between other groups and come up with some solutions. So what's the stress of one particular group? There might be a solution coming from, from a different group of people. And, and that was set up within our sort of performance and development plan groups and um, being able to share those ideas as a team. And then we've been able to take those away as a leadership group and been able to sort of put them together and been able to see whether there are things that we've got coming up with um, within our professional learning program that might be able to address some of those things. Um, but also, you know, some responses that we can just quickly make that might sort of alleviate some of those, uh, some of those concerns from staff. So that's been something that's, uh, that's been really good and will be something that we continue to do. But also we've, um, we've implemented a new reporting and assessment process at the school. Um, and so that's really sort of taken hold for this semester. And so at the beginning of the semester we asked teachers um, and all staff um, who are involved in that reporting and assessment process to to give us an idea of their commitment towards that process that we've set up and, and the structure of it. Um, and that was something that was really visual, that we were able to get um, a really quick snapshot of, um, of where that people was at and, and happily it was sort of at the, um, at the, at the end that you want to have that, uh, that sort of laying up around sort of the you know, sort of 7 8 percent, which was good. Um, I guess for us, uh, one of the things that I do is have an open door so people come in and do pretty free to come and tell me their feedback. Sometimes it's not so good, sometimes it is. Um, usually they're fairly blunt. And um, also we've introduced um, in our leading teacher meetings a time when we have issues or matters of importance and leading teachers bring up things that they've sensed around the school that might be the <coughs> feedback from the staff that we discuss. Um, and uh, with our parents and friends, uh, we give them the opportunity to have a representative on the school council so they bring in any issues that they've heard around the school that might be of importance, they bring those to the school council and uh, we have those for discussion as well. And lastly, in the staff meetings, um, I will introduce, or have introduced um, every term, a time when people are able to say what's going well, what's not going well, and they tend to um, feel quite free to give feedback as well. We haven't done any formal um, feedback in terms of our leadership, but I suppose that's something we might look back at doing the 360 degrees or something like that, which allows people to give that formal feedback. In a perfect world, our leadership teams are completely on board with the uh, 
vision that we have for our school. How do you ensure that when your leaders leave their leadership team meeting, that they are walking the talk and they're actually doing what the whole team has agreed to do and they're not going off on their own tangent and following their own beliefs? I mean, obviously, obviously that, that, that's something that within our leadership team that, that we wanted to develop as a, as a norm, I guess, um, at, the beginning of, at the beginning of each year about what we expect of each other and, and how, we can, uh, how we can work towards ensuring that that, uh, that, that actually occurs. Um, I think one of the difficult things there, it goes back to one of the earlier questions that Judy had around, um, you know, capacity of, of each of the leadership team members, I think. Uh, one of the things that we've definitely needed to do with our leadership team um, is identify those strengths and, and uh, areas for improvement within, within the leadership team. And, and I guess being able to, you know, with, with in hindsight, being able to identify those areas for improvement earlier, um, being able to put that support in um, earlier would, would, would achieve, um, uh, you know, sort of even greater impact in terms of the whole leadership team sort of achieving what you said, being on the same page. Um, for us, it's, it's probably there is a, a role for mentoring, definitely. There are some, some of the staff who are um, very much on board and also have the capabilities to continue what we've talked about in leadership meetings, uh, whereas some of the others don't. But we've, we have discussed um, consistency, we've talked about it a lot. We've talked about, um, just as we say, there's a variation between the, the teachers in the classroom, that there is a variation between the leaders. And we discuss what is expected when it goes back to the teams. Um, we're now having a quite a lengthy discussion about the standards and what that means and the consistent approach to the standards and, and the evidence that is needed to be um, pre presented for those standards. So there is a variation, um, but it's, it's coming back to the leadership and continually talking about it and saying what the expectation is and having a clear expectation. It's an interesting question, Rob. Uh, I think that's probably the most important question, to be honest. Uh, it, you know, I think that your, your principal team will be very cohesive and behind you, no doubt. Um, but the work is going to come through your leading teachers, so the capacity of the principal team to influence the leading teachers becomes then critical, I think, because they're the ones going back into the teams, and that's really where I think the message can actually be lost a little bit, lose a little bit of power. Um, and so I think that you're right to target that area to focus on. I think that uh, Claire touched before on a critical point though, I think sometimes you know, I kind of get lost in the ideas and I, I have a really deep understanding of what it is that I'm trying to achieve, but, but because I'm doing that with my principal team and not the leading teachers, um, do they actually have the same ownership and commitment that I've got to it and do they have the same depth of understanding around that and so when they go back to their teams and they're challenged, do they really know you know, deeply why we're doing what we're doing and I think that's really important that when you're talking about some critical things um, that you're ensuring uh, ownership and buy-in from, you know, those key stakeholders because they are the drivers. You know, a recent initiative that we were looking to implement and it, had a, it was a beautiful plan um, and it would, it would have gone perfectly. Um, the other thing we forgot was that, you know, we had to actually get buys, you know, um, buy-in from the, the um, leading teachers, so we did some work with some consultants, KPMG, who were working with us, and they said, yeah, look, that's a really good plan, but where's your engagement strategy? Like, who's actually going to deliver this? You need to stop, go back, spend time working this through with your leading teachers, because they've got to own it. If they're the ones delivering it, they've got to own it. So I think that's that, that's where you're going to get that buy-in, but um, I think another part of that, which is um, that idea of what are you prepared to be tied on, and what are you prepared to be loose on, what are the things that you know, each of the teams need to have their own a bit of autonomy. You know, they need to have some space to be able to make their own decisions, but not so much space that you, that you kind of lose that consistency in your organisation. So it's a really, oh, I think it's probably the most crucial question around running an effective school is getting that, that right with your, your leading teachers. Yeah. Um, thanks, Rob. Um, Hello, Peter Hutton, Temple State College. Uh, sometimes I think that schools are too much about teachers and not enough about students. Uh, this conference is one about leadership. I'm just wondering if the panel could talk about uh, the experience of student voice and that informal leadership that students can provide 
other than through formal leadership positions like school captain, prefect, etc., and uh, other than SIC, which most of us would also have. Before we start, you might go, I think that one of the things that's really important, I guess, is, is feedback loops. Uh, and so far, uh, our students get feedback from their teachers every five weeks through a GPA process, and that's really important feedback to help guide their growth as learners. Uh, but similarly, we have um, surveys of every teacher um, by every class, and that, that survey data is, is done once a term and fed back to the, the teachers, so they're actually getting clear indications, actually, of, of where their um, strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and they can look at different classes, so potentially, you know, someone who's doing really well with their year 11 and 12 classes, but less well with their year 8, so maybe that's an area then for them to focus. So I think good information helps people make good decisions, and that student voice comes through there. I think the other one is just um, running, we run focus groups uh, regularly, at least once a semester, to get feedback on things that we're hoping have been implemented well, but really understanding from the student's perspective, because as I said before, we have great plans in the principal's office and kind of the further away from the principal's office, the less uh, well understood and the less well implemented it is. So looking, you know, in terms of that kind of fidelity, how well is it being um, received at the other end through um, students' experience in the school? Uh, and so I think that that's, that they're two ways that we would try and, and, and get some uh, understanding about, as you said, our most important stakeholders and how they're experiencing the school. Yeah, I mean, we had a really unique opportunity, I guess, at, at Surf Coast to really engage with, uh, with the students um, who were already in the school and who were looking to, to join the school in the, in the coming, year, coming years around, around all about branding and uniform, all of those sorts of decisions that we needed to make as we were, um, as we were sort of um, beginning. Um, and one of the really interesting things from that was that... Um, you know, I would have thought that, you know, the students wouldn't have wanted to have ties, wouldn't have wanted blazers, wouldn't have wanted to really sort of, you know, lax approach to uniform and things like that. But actually talking to the students revealed a really different picture to, to what I was expecting and to, to what a lot of our parents were expecting, to what a lot of the teachers are in the school were expecting. And I guess the, the really important lesson to get from that was that you can assume all you want, but until you actually talk to the students, you're not going to know the full picture. And, um, as Rob said, the idea of focus groups and, and those sorts of things are really important. But something that's um, really present in our learning and teaching program um, is the need for students to reflect on reflect on their work, um, and that's part of the process that when they when they submit work uh, for assessment, that there is a reflection um, from the students on what's happened. And um, you know, we've been in a situation where we've been asking for feedback from kids on the approach to learning and teaching. Uh, continuously over the past sort of two and a half years and um, we've now got this extremely discerning group of students at Surf Coast who want to have their say in, you know, about every single decision that gets made at the school, so, uh, which, is, which is fantastic, we've been tossing times, but it's, which is fantastic that they want to be that involved in their school and even when we're moving into the development of a new year nine program, students are actually part of that um, part of that actual uh, planning group that, you know, that, that met after school. So, and that was a really empowering sort of experience that was led by one of our assistant principals to get parents, students um, and teachers um, around the same table talking about the sorts of things that need to be included um, in a year nine learning and teaching program. And you know, I think that was a, you know, a, a really uh, fantastic example of student voice actually working and, um, and having a, having a direct impact on, on what happens um, on the day-to-day workings within the school. We haven't got, I've got much more to add. We do the same focus groups and we ask students for um, feedback on some of the programs that we've developed and they also give feedback on the teachers in the classroom. Uh, I think there's probably more we can do. Our SRC uh, is active and it does go out to get different groups together. Um, if they have uh, they want an opinion on something, they go out and they get groups to give that opinion and then feed it back to school council, for example. Uh, they wanted to change the sports uniform, so they went out and talked to a whole lot of students, um, they got the feedback, they brought it to school council, and the things that they wanted altered were altered. So there is a capacity for that voice to be heard, uh, but I don't necessarily think we provide enough channels for it to be heard. Um, any other comments that any of the panel would like to make? <coughs>
No, look, I've been, I, I guess, I guess myself, um, you know, I've, I've been in the role now just for, just for three years as a, as a principal, but, um, but I think one of the, one of the really important aspects of, um, of, of, you know, being involved in, uh, in, in school leadership is the idea of being able to have um, uh, support from, from colleagues and um, from people also who, um, who are interested in, in the work that you do in the school. And going back to, to the idea around, um, around school council, I feel really fortunate to have a school council president that I can talk to about the issues that come up regularly within, uh, within the school. And we were talking about that sort of whole idea around um, uh, being within a, within a smaller community and, and uh, the impacts that that can have. And I think that's been a really important part of um, I've got the role being able to sort of talk to, you know, as we're about the sorts of issues that are coming up and a bit like Rob said, you don't want those surprises to occur for those key people within, uh, within the organisation of the school, um, but also more widely from, from, uh, from, from colleagues and uh, from people that you've worked with at, uh, at different schools. It's good to be able to have that, that ongoing relationship and ability to be able to talk about the things that come up, um, you know, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. Bernie wants us to have morning tea now, so thank you very much, Claire and Scott.